You know, this is a very lean statement. 10 images to mark my career, like, who do you choose? Like, it's really hard to get to 10. And so let's pick the ones with the richest stories or the ones that were the loudest to me as, as voices and as sort of powerful people of change. The initial reason why I got into photography was to have an exchange with a human being that would mark a moment that would never be the same again. And I think that as a premise for everything that I've done throughout my entire career has always been at, at the core, you know? Thinking about the artists that I've worked with, album covers that I've done, the growth of artists, every moment that you look back to has always been, you know, Jay-Z at Reasonable Doubt 96, and then he's changing and evolving in 1998 for volume one, changing again, changing again, the growth, and, and I think being part of that journey, being able to document these things so richly, so fully in the form of doing these album covers has always been um, really paramount in my career. It's funny, I look back at, at my folks, uh, you know, a Christmas present one year was, that, let's get him a camera and see if he's into it. It was a Minolta. You know, I picked it up, shot it, maybe in the Cayman Islands once and kind of put it back down. It was never one of these, like, I had one since I was four and I grew up shooting. And, uh, you know, it was sort of like, eh, it's cool. It was only when I was at my senior year at Kenyon College that I really said, this is going to be a perfect blend of dealing with people, of making a moment that'll never be the same again, um, and, and documenting and having that live on throughout history. I was afforded the opportunity to work with the greatest photographer of all time uh, in my book, Richard Avedon. You know, we shot Pirelli calendars, Versace campaigns. Um, Avedon was one of the most generous souls I've ever encountered and certainly gave me the platform of how the photography business runs so that I could then apply it to what I loved, which was hip hop. Narrowing down tens of thousands of my photos to just 10 was no easy feat, but we finally did it. They represent pivotal moments that will never be the same again and serve as a time capsule of culture for the last 20 years. What I'm really hoping for people to walk away with is an understanding that even in a very brief statement of 10 images, there's power. There's real understanding of the journey that we've all taken together because there's no way for me to do what I've done um, as successfully as I have without people enjoying the work on the back end. And certainly that's a testament to what I'm creating. I was uh, afforded the opportunity, thanks to Harv um, at Bad Boy, uh, the ability to shoot at the Palladium and not a lot of people, you know, there were cameras in there for sure, but there wasn't, it was a very select crew of people. And I decided to fight a little harder than the rest of the crew and I ended up on stage holding Little Kim's hand for half of the performance. The place was just sweaty and um, just incredible energy and Big was there and it was, you know, this excitement. Busta was in the, in the building, Jay-Z, I mean, name anybody and they were there because they knew that this was like, this was Brooklyn, this was our guy stepping into this like new spotlight of going platinum. And I think this is probably, for me, one of the first really crucial uh, images that I was able to kind of show to say, here's how I see, here's my vision. And um, because of this picture of Big on stage with Puff rocking, tearing down the place, this audience that's glued, him perfectly centered in this image, you know, with like still well surrounded on stage by everybody from Ed Lover to Harv to Hawk to, you know, you name it, was just this, this sweet spot that really marked what 1995 felt like to me, what New York City felt like, what these clubs feel like. Moses' ability to transform and become different versions of himself, all authentic, you know, is, is pretty much unparalleled. This particular shot, we decided just to go 
um, down by the water. There was a moment that I was shooting Polaroids and I had an idea that, that sort of like came across and it was basically like he pointed to where the towers used to be, right? So I did one version of him pointing to the towers here and then a second Polaroid over there where he pointed to the second tower. So he's on the outside of the frames pointing this way to where the towers were. And, you know, we were just kind of speaking about, you know, just a moment of, of sacrifice, of lives lost, of, um, you know, just big hearted New Yorkers that really like show up for their own. And I think that when you look at it, it's just a moment of heart. It's a moment of representing New York. It's a moment of understanding um, that anytime we lose one of our own, like we are less strong as, as a unit. I was commissioned to do a shoot for Hip Hop and Cultural Odyssey, which is this massive oversized book. Um, and it was all to be shot on a 20 by 24 Polaroid camera, of which there are three in the world. There's one in Berlin, one in San Fran, one in New York. So this was a New York session. And really it was a very different way of shooting. Um, in that I only got about seven or eight individual single frames in any given day because you know the Polaroid camera was a ton of rent you know the Polaroid was very precious it was like three hundred dollars a sheet and it was a moment that like it would come out and you'd slice it and then you'd have to wait a minute and a half and then peel it and that was your final product and Missy I think is somebody that like is she is about kind of movement and energy and kind of that dynamic so it was very interesting because we had to make her sort of more still. This is sort of about the duality of nature, right? That there is a calm, introspective, reflective kind of version of him that thinks about all of this stuff that he's going to deliver with this like high energy emotion, you know, so it was sort of the balance of these two kind of worlds. And I would constantly have to reset him, you know? Like, okay, cool, we got that with the hands and the loud scream. You know, let's do the calm of that. I want you to close your eyes. And it was just kind of a moment of peace. And then he would go into this like introspective, reflective, different poses that we would do. Again, hands being hugely expressive for me were very much a part of what we were creating. But I just remember somehow this reset had almost as much power as anything animated that was done. And I think the image certainly that we presented is just sort of him in this moment of calm, like, I don't really have to say too much. I'm Kendrick, you know what I stand for, and it doesn't have to be all the bells and whistles and craziness. It's like, I'm dominating this frame. I started working with The Source, and uh, there was an opportunity to go to Atlanta. And I'd been to Atlanta one time, but just like kind of driving through, I was like, ah, cool place, good vibe. But uh, little did I know my life would change going to Atlanta to shoot the Mighty Mighty Outcast. I remember being on this street and seeing this exact mural, all of it behind me, and it's when AT Aliens came out. So I was just thinking, you know, aliens in outer space, and I saw this and I kind of jumped out. And just started to build my story. This was the original footsteps that I stood in in order to begin to build that story, waiting for Big Boy to arrive. We were meeting right around this area. But uh, you know, this wall and these hands, like I definitely have like old contact sheets with all this stuff on it. As far as being a visual person and capturing these images that have defined these artists, you know, I just always want to be in these, these footsteps. What feels like home soil to them? Take me right there, take me to the house, take me to your grandmother's house, take me to the school, take me where you got beat up for the first time. You know, it's like all of those kind of components. They, they trigger memories. And for me, it's about going layers deeper into the story. I want to be able to go back in 2016 to where I shot in 1998 and for it to still be there and say, look, wow, this is, as a young boy, first time in Atlanta, shooting, getting a chance to shoot for the source, and I'm coming back to the exact footsteps. I don't know, there's something important about that to me out there. In this case, Khaled had his own idea of what he wanted. He's like, I want to be like Haile Selassie on my cover. I was, like, I was like, those are big shoes, Khaled. So I said, look, you know, I'm in, man. Let, let's get you as close. Like, those are all the references that I would pull. Let me send you some references. Let's see where your head is at. He's like, I want to lie in. 
I was like, all right, all right, we'll get you a lion. Lions are like eight grand, so like be prepared because your budget is like lean, man. That's like a lot of the budget. So I want, I might want two lions. I was like, no, 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 you want one lion. Like cool out with your lions. So we got a lion named Phoenix, uh, named Felix, who came through and, and we delivered. But uh, and he's like, I want to be in a field of flowers with lions. <laughs> All right, what kind of flowers, Callie? Yellow ones, blue ones, red ones, purple ones. I was like, all right, we're gonna have every, I got you, I got you. I was like, we won't get a field, but we will adorn your sort of presence. He's like, I want a throne. So he's just like, he's a nut, but we did it, you know? And I, I think his belief in what he was doing, for what purpose, and knowing what his people were, were responding to the influences of seeing these beautiful flowers. All right? That's why the flowers get infused. They get infused in a strange way. Him loving Caribbean culture, you know what I mean? The whole bless up business, you know what I mean? He gains a lot of, even if it's just wordplay or like sentiment or presence or an understanding of, of you know, conscious living, you know, like that's, that's I think what we pull, you know, both from, from kind of that culture and, and just a spirit and an ease. You know, so he's drawing his influences together and then still, still delivering, you know, what becomes this iconic thing. And he really got behind it and he really put his own money forward and he really, like, loved it. And, and you know, and I think one thing that's, that's very interesting is, you know, he was very conscious of always, like, adding me as the person who created the visual. We rented this spacesuit out in LA to make him this astronaut and then we we're gonna drop him into outer space. And uh, I think that he had probably too good a time the night before at the Grammys celebrating. There may have been a beverage, a, a bottle popped, perhaps two. Um, he didn't show up. So I said, look, if I never get an opportunity to shoot him for this, let me shoot my assistant in the spacesuit. So we did a full day and we had him on a bus and I had shot him before and I figured out I could take another picture and drop it into the face hole and then it would happen and we'd at least have a cover. So that was my problem solving and we got a call um, the following day and it was like, look, Wayne's gonna give you time. Let's fly the spacesuit down to Miami and, and do it again. He was like so into the idea, in a good mood, really gave us quality time. That spacesuit, the feet are pieces of wood that are solid wood. He was just, he was like smoking out a little bit and he'd put the thing down and it would all fog up. He'd open it like a Cheech and Chong burst would come out. And it was just one of these moments of just him having fun and like really like living and going for it. And uh, at one point he started like skidding across the room, right? Like with these like little weird toe taps. I was like, oh my God. And he just started busting out laughing. I started crying laughing. He was trying to do the moonwalk, but the, the heels were so hard that it didn't look like that. So the moment of laughter was actually the documentation of him trying to do the moonwalk, but failing miserably and just like really just getting a kick out of himself. One, that he thought to do the moonwalk. Two, that it was poorly executed. Three, that we all got it. You know, it's just one of these connected moments, man, with the right people in the right room, with the right energy. And, uh, you know, these images, you know, certainly are lasting. I felt that it was truly important for In My Lifetime Volume 1 to go back to Marcy, to begin to go to the roots of what made him him over the years. We went back and I said, tell me the story. And so I was walking around Marcy and this and kids doing wheelies and like, you really just got a sense of life. At one point, he took this kid's bike. He was in a maroon sweatsuit, Adidas sweatsuit, top and bottom, with a white tee on. You know, he jumped on the bike, rode around, and then there's a whole bunch of kids. I, and I, I always have these references in my mind of these like old Ali photos, you know, where he's engaging the youth because he knows that, you know, like little kids, when you spend time with them and give them attention, like that, it's life changing for these kids. 
My name's Snoop, I was five years old when we took the picture. I was the one to the right hand side of Jay, blinking my eyes. I was like eight years old. I was on the right hand, I was right behind him. You can't even see my face. You wanted to see my forehead, my ear. I'm Mel. I was right to the left of them, on the right of Jay. You only can see one of my eyes because Snoop Big Ass Head was in front. <laughs> I'm Rel. I was eight years old, and I'm right on the left of Jay. When I think about my life now and back then was, it was just fun, literally. Like, these are the people that we hung out with every day from getting out of school at 3 o'clock, walking to school in the morning, walking from school, going upstairs trying to get your homework done as quick as possible, you know, to come outside and play basketball until your mom started calling you out the window. This was the village. We all was family. It was just, we ain't have no worries. We was just kids here, so, you know? It's a totally no worries at all. All we worry about was getting out of school and chasing the girls here. I always kind of use these as tools as I build my stories out. And in my lifetime, volume one, this panoramic shot, which again was, was a choice. We had like maybe 10, 15 cameras in rotation. It wasn't just digital, this was a Fuji 617. And I was like, I want to paint a big picture down to the bag hanging on the fence. You know, again, these, these tables are no longer there, but each one of those kids was there because they knew that Jay was there. And I think that looking back at images like this, you know, these, these are the moments, I think, that, that define the spirit of the generations continuing what this movement is gonna feel like and actually infusing the heart that we, ha we understand it to have and giving it now to the next, the next generation. There's an artist that I believe changed the game, and I think you'd be hard pressed to argue with me about this, but uh, that person is Drake. Um, the moment that he came out with So Far Gone and all the tunes on that, it was a moment, I think, that the industry kind of recalibrated and like maybe softened a little bit or like embraced the R&B roots. And I think there's so many hip hop fans that are huge R&B fans, and he was sort of this incredible kind of hybrid. Um, I had the opportunity to shoot him the day before he signed his deal, the day he signed his deal, and the day he went home to Toronto to celebrate. And this was for the Fader magazine. I photographed him, and this was a shoot more about style. This was him in a Versace bubble jacket. This is in Toronto, but here's the crazy part of this story. Shooting him in Toronto, right, there was a huge blackout, like blackout from like the night before we had no lights, like we, we, we were gonna, you know, we were gonna plug in and get some lights and whatever. And, uh, and then they lost all the power. And so like every place closed, we couldn't find anything. I was like, nothing changes whether I have power or not. You know, cause he's like, I'm not, let's just cancel, let's do it another day. I was like, no, 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 we're gonna shoot today. Thank God I have my technical ability and like literally every single photo is exactly as it would have been because we found a generator and we hustled and we problem solved and got it and I shot daylight and we plugged in a plug in the back of our rental car that happened to have like an adapter plug thing and ran the laptop off of that. Like, it's like by any means necessary. But like you look at this image and you think, oh, it's just another calm day. Like he's there, he's calm, he's looking down, introspective. But like the way we had to fight for this, man, was, <laughs> was crazy. It looks really glamorous. The final product always looks really clean, but like what goes into the creation of these images, you know, like it's only now that we get to share these kind of stories of like with zero power, that's what we do. I knew that there was a sense that I had of her and of her spirit and that people weren't, like they would go glam and it was cool and really good stuff was happening, but I was like, there's another gear, man. She's got so much more, like, please give me a chance. And they finally did, and they said, look, you know, this is gonna be a stressful shoot. You have to come up with 10 looks, and you're gonna get about three hours or four hours max in order to do this and create this. And I said, no problem. She just lit up the room. You know, every time anybody speaks about an interaction with her, meeting her, or the spirit that she kind of gives off, you know, it was that times about 10 in real life. The crew around her, her mom was there, her styling crew was all, 
you know, just totally with her, like, come on, let's go, let's work hard, let's do this, like, emote. And it, it started out, we did a shot of her against this, like, ripped jeans backdrop with this sort of 90s throwback outfit. And I was like, just sing, I just want to hear your voice. And she was belting out tunes and emoting, and so, like, that kind of broke the ice, put her in her comfort zone. And it was, this, you know, sort of a strategy for me to, like, make her comfortable and forget that she's here for photos. You know, and, and to look back and to really feel like this is the most Aliyah that will ever feel her be because of her, you know, untimely passing. You know, it's, uh, it's an honor. The image that I'm sharing with you guys now was shot uh, uh, by the Javits Center and it was with a 34 um, Ford with like suicide doors and flames down the side and it was more kind of like the Joan Jett rocker leather with like some hawk printed stitched in like styling was fly but she was very uh, engaged and that like nice balance of like tough sexy you know and I think the presence in this image and her engaging quality and that she's looking right through you really um, encapsulated that particular shot. The gallery that we did in Atlanta called Focus was incredible. The energy in the room was vibrant and rich and connected. There was positivity everywhere. People just really wanted the stories. They wanted to feel something. They wanted their questions answered about exactly what happened in that photo. What was Biggie doing on stage in 95? You know, what was Aaliyah like? We'll never get to meet her. What did that feel like? You know, these are the stories. And this is also the responsibility of the photographer to be able to give these stories back based on the access that we had in those moments. To give these and to pass along this oral history to the next generation, to let them understand how rich this culture is and to continue building upon what we've established as a foundation was critical.